Turn in your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now, this is the second part of a uh, message that I preached two weeks ago. And I promised Naomi I was going to finish it today and get to, you know, get to the meat and potatoes of the message. Uh, so it's, it's been sitting here. The notes have been sitting here for the last two weeks, just waiting and ready. Um, and because last week was Anniversary Sunday, I uh, preached something else, which was what the Lord had led to do. But today is a continuation, and I won't say the finality of the, the message from two weeks ago, because if I say today's the final part for sure, it'll probably go into next week. Uh, I don't plan for it to go into next week, but we'll see. But the message being, as we've been going through the book of 1 Corinthians, uh, we're going to take a look at one verse to focus on just to start, uh, to, to highlight uh, the, the point of the message, just to start. So 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27 says, Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. And that is the message this morning, part two of Ye Are the Body of Christ. And the, the focus on being the, the message on the church and church membership in particular. Is it biblical? Uh, what does the Bible say about it? And what does it mean as far as being part of a church? So let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask the Lord to speak to us through His Word this morning. Heavenly Father, thank You for the day and this time in your word, and Lord, this very important subject, and I pray that you would please help us to have receptive hearts. Uh, may the message be exactly what you want it to be, and it would be clear, plain, understandable, and that uh, you would minister every life in the way that you know how. And Lord, I pray that you bless this time. May we bring you glory. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to give you some background, and just it's been two weeks. And uh, so oftentimes I, I give background, even if it's been one week, but I especially need to give some background if it's been two weeks, is that when we look at the Bible, proper Bible interpretation should involve the grammatical, historical, uh, literal, and contextual meaning of words and verses. So what that means is, if we, if we are going to understand the Bible properly, we first need to ask the question of, to whom was it written? What is the context of this verse or these set of verses or this chapter? We also look at individual words and we should look at them in just a normal grammatical meaning, uh, their historical meaning. Uh, the, the, just We take the Bible, we should take the Bible literally unless there's something in the context that indicates that it's figurative. There are certain figures and pictures in the Bible, but you can tell that by the context. So some people want to figuratize the whole Bible. They, they take a verse and they just go all kinds of places with it, or they take a chapter and just go all kinds of places with it. That has nothing to do with what <laughs> it originally means in the first place. And so I, I, I gave that foundation two weeks ago because of, the, of what the word church means in the Bible. When you see the word church, it comes from the word ekklesia, which is a Greek word that means a called out assembly or a congregation. So it is an assembly that is called out to come together for a specific purpose. And so when you take the word church of meaning that, it means that when there are people that, that decide, you know what, we're going to meet together in this place or there's many other places, that is an assembly. That is a congregation. That is what that word means. And, and now not every church, not every place that calls itself a church or some sort of congregation is one that Jesus would call one of his churches. So a church can be a church, an assembly can be a church, a religious assembly can be a church. But there, in the Bible, we see that Jesus has his idea of his own assembly. So not every assembly, not every sign that says that they're a church lines up with the Bible as to what Jesus said a church should be. And so a church, yes, is a religious assembly, but Jesus started his church. He has an assembly. He has a congregation. Now, we looked at the past, present, and future. We had the past congregation uh, was uh, Israel, was the church in the wilderness, the Bible speaks of. So God had called out that nation uh, as, as a special people, uh, separated them unto himself for a particular purpose. And so they were called the church in the wilderness. Why? Because they were 
God's assembly, a congregation in the wilderness. And then that was in the past. God is still not finished with the nation of Israel. But as far as his present assembly, his present congregation, uh, that is a, a church consists of both Jew and Gentile. So it was not just the children of Israel. That was, that was in the past in the, in the Old Testament. But the present is that the churches of today are made up of Jew or Gentile, that there is no difference spiritually in God's eyes as far as salvation is concerned, that God wants Jew and Gentile to be saved the same way through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then, as I said, God's not done with Israel as a nation. There's a certain plan for them. There's some things that are going to happen that the Bible speaks about. But then what about the future? Or, sorry, the present congregation are visible assemblies on earth. The present churches are visible assemblies on earth. And then the future congregation is all the redeemed of all ages. Everyone who's been saved will then meet together in heaven, and that will be that assembly when all are gathered together in heaven. Uh, so that will really be the finality of God's congregation, that all things, everything will be gathered together, all people will be gathered together who have trusted in Christ. Now, we also dealt with the, this doctrine. Given that the word church means a called-out assembly, it's a congregation, we dealt with the origins of the universal church doctrine. This is a very popular doctrine, and it is one that uh, is even common among uh, many people who are very strong Bible believers. And often uh, what happens is this doctrine has taken root because people have been taught a certain definition of a word, and so then when they read the Bible, they want to force that preconceived definition of the word church into, what the, into, that, into the Bible verses. But it doesn't mean the context actually supports that and, and its actual definition. Now, the origins of the universal church is, uh, comes from the Catholic uh, <clears throat> church, or I should say maybe the Catholic church is a, uh, an outworking of that doctrine one way or another, however you want to look at it, because the word Catholic does mean universal. And so, uh, so when the Catholic church, uh, which uh, both Catholic and Protestant will will uh, recognize certain of the creeds, like the Nicene Creed or the Apostles' Creed. And the, both the Nicene Creed and Apostles' Creed say Catholic Church. We believe in the Holy Catholic Church. They're believing in a universal church. Now, the Catholic Church believes in a visible universal church, and they believe they are that church, like one organization. They believe we're Christ's church, but they believe in a worldwide church. Catholic Church, which is visible, which means Catholic churches are the part of the visible, that visible universal church. Now, the Protestants, when they disagreed with the Catholic Church, uh, they, they came out and they had some various uh, you know, different ideas. They opposed the hierarchy. They opposed the, the, uh, the, the uh, certain things about the way things were done in the Catholic Church. So the Protestants came out. And they still, though, believed in a Catholic church. They still believed in a universal church. They just taught that the universal church is invisible. It's not visible. So the Catholic church isn't that universal church. We believe in a universal church, invisible, which means that it's everybody who's a Christian is part of that invisible church. So people of all different types of churches are part of that uh, universal church. And so today, there are many, even Baptists, who will teach a universal church or invisible church, or they'll say invisible universe, they'll say body of Christ in that broad sense. And what they're doing is they are pulling from the Protestant definition of the church. And the, uh, the Baptists, though, historically have believed, and by the way, today, just because the church calls itself Baptist doesn't mean, you know, the word Baptist isn't a magic word that means just because they call themselves Baptist doesn't mean that they are, that they are right as far as in, in biblical sense. There are some, uh, there are most Baptist churches, you know, have uh, the foundational things correct, but there, there are a lot of things that are different uh, depending on what church it is. So just because the word says Baptist doesn't mean that everything is exactly the same in Baptist, all Baptist churches. Um, but Baptists historically, true Bible-believing Baptists, believed 
in a local congregation. They believed in a local assembly. And I'm going to read something. It just happened to come in, uh, I think it was yesterday, I got this email from uh, uh, Brother uh, Carney, our mi the missionary we support to Hungary, Mike Carney. Um, he shared this to a, uh, a group, that I, an email group that I'm a part of. And I thought it was very good. He said he shared it six years ago, um, but he uh, thought he would share this again. And I'm not going to read the entire thing, but this really, I thought, wow, this is perfect. This ties in perfectly with the message for Sunday. Is that 356 years ago in a Boston court, and remember that Boston, the Massachusetts Bay Colony, was controlled by the Puritans or uh, Congregationalists, and so they did not believe in the separation of church and state. They believed you need to be part of our group. You need to be a Puritan. You need to be a Congregationalist uh, back when the colonies were first being settled. And so that was the, the Massachusetts Bay Colony. The, uh, it says, 350 years ago, this month in a public court in Boston, the leaders of what was probably the first Baptist congregation in Boston were brought before the magistrates to be persecuted and punished for their faith. Now, he attaches part of a confession here that was from the First Baptist Church of Boston. In certain ways, it would be like a statement of faith. Uh, it is very interesting. The confession is very interesting that in that it is backed up with Scripture. There was no adherence to church authority. When he's saying church authority, talking about the hierarchy of the Puritans, uh, men or historical evidence. Simply the Word of God was their authority of their faith. Now, there are two points of interest that I found that, that pertain to what we're talking about today, is that the, they had an emphasis that a church of Christ is a visible church. And then under another point, they, you'll read that this church has the right to receive visible believers. In other words, visible believers belong in visible churches. Makes a lot of sense. Um, one of the charges leveled against them was that they practiced the Lord's Supper with someone who is excommunicated from the church, meaning the Puritan slash Congregational Church of the region. So here they were establishing the independent authority and autonomy of the local church. They were also charged with accepting a pastor who was not ordained by the church. And... Um, so here's this portion taken from pages 69 through 71. I'm not going to read the whole thing. But it's the history of the First Baptist Church of Boston. Uh, this church was organized June 7, 1665. And on August 20th, uh, Richard Russell Esquire issued a warrant to the constable of Charlestown requiring him in His Majesty's name to labor to discover where these people assembled and to require them to attend the established worship. If they refused, they were to have their names and places of residence returned to the nearest magistrate. They were discovered, refused to give up their own meetings, and were consequently brought before the Court of Assistance in the seventh month, which at that time was September, where they exhibited their confession of faith, which has remained unaltered as the received confession of faith of this church unto this day. So, uh, so just to give a little bit, I'm going to, it's kind of hard to read because the way that they wrote some of the English words back at that time were uh, different than they are today, but I, I will do my best to read it, some of the spellings and things. Uh, we believe with the heart and confess with the mouth, and they go on believing in one God, the creator and governor of all things, distinguished into Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, uh, that this is life eternal, to know the only true God and Jesus Christ whom he hath sent. Um, and let's go on down here. We believe Christ is the foundation laid by the Father of whom Moses and the prophets wrote and the apostles preached, who is that great prophet whom we are to hear in all things, who hath perfectly revealed out of the bosom of his Father and the whole word and will of God, which his servants are to know and uh, believe and obey, uh, Christ, his commission to his disciples to teach and baptize. And those that gladly receive the word and are baptized are saints by calling. And notice what it says here. And fit matter for a visible church and a competent number of such joined together in covenant and fellowship of the gospel 
are a church of Christ. So know what they say. No, notice what they say here. And a competent number of such joined together in covenant and fellowship of the gospel are a church of Christ. So what a church of Christ is and what this early, early Baptist church decide, uh, had declared was we believe that joined together is a group of people, not just assembling in the sense they happen to be here, but they're joined together in a covenant and fellowship. There's a common bond, first of all, starting with the gospel. But then, you know, then, of course, uh, they have this statement of faith, basically their confession of what they believe. So it would have been built around that as well. So uh, very much a precedent we see um, for hundreds of years having statements of faith that this is what we believe as a church. Uh, those that, uh, let's see, uh, we believe that a church thus constituted are to walk in all the appointments of Christ and have power from Him to choose from among themselves their own officers whom the gospel allows to administer in the ordinances of Christ among them whom they may dis uh, uh, depute, I think it says, or ordain to this end. And this church hath power to receive into their fellowship visible believers. And if any prove scandalous, obstinate, and wicked to put forth such from amongst them. And, uh, and it goes, goes on that, uh, and by the way, uh, they believed in meeting together the first day of the week. And uh, so hundreds of years, uh, meeting, even Baptist meeting the first day of the week. So what's the point of that? Well, the point of that was, they recognize what a church of Christ is, a church of Christ. Now, they, they're not, there, is, there are some churches that are called the so-and-so church of Christ, and that's not what we're talking about. They're talking about just in concept, not the title, but a church of Christ is a group of saved and baptized believers who have covenanted together, they have joined together, bonding with a common doctrine, with common beliefs, uh, is as a church. And that that local church, that, that there's, there's no, there was no other hierarchy, no other human hierarchy into that church. They themselves had the power to ordain their own pastors, uh, to receive members, and to even put members out of the church who were wicked or uh, basically who, who were, um, I said, obstinate and, uh, and, and various things. And so that, I just, I just wanted to read part of that because I thought that just fits perfectly of even seeing hundreds of years ago, three over, well over 300 years ago, the, uh, the, the uh, testimony of the Baptist churches, and that was even right here in Massachusetts. And so, they, uh, so we, we t covered those things last week, and, or two weeks ago, and so what I wanted to also make clear is, by saying that a church of Christ is a visible congregation of believers, once again, that does not undermine or minimize the fact that anyone who is a believer in Jesus Christ, anyone who has trusted Christ to save them from their sins, is in Christ spiritually. That we have a spiritual position in Christ, Amen. that we are saved, our sins are forgiven, uh, we've been translated into the kingdom of God's dear Son. And uh, so in that way, none of those things change. It's simply what people will do oftentimes today is cross the two up. Well, because I'm saved, oh, I'm part of the church now, and it, and it can minimize, it can harm the, um, the, uh, uh, what God has intended for the uh, church. There are unintended consequences of the universal church doctrine. It results in misuse of the ordinances. It can undermine the importance and authority of local churches and church membership. Uh, it can divert resources away from local churches, and it also results in very great ecumenicalism. So that's where we left off two weeks ago. And let's jump in here now, going to Matthew chapter 16. And just to give you some basic doctrines, basic teaching about the church, about the church. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18. Matthew 16, verse 18 says, And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, there's a couple of different things with this statement. Number one, Jesus said, I will build my church. 
So he is, he is saying, I have an assembly. I have a congregation. And I will build it. But he says, unto, unto, upon this rock. What was the rock? Now, the idea is that, uh, number one, Peter was not the first pope. There's no historical evidence at all to, to, to show that Peter was the first pope. That's a claim that is made, but there's no evidence to back it up. Uh, the other thing is that what was the rock he was talking about? The rock he's talking about is when Peter said that statement, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, in, in verse 16. You know, Jesus said, Who do you say that I am? He says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, upon this rock, upon that statement. And Jesus was also talking about himself upon this rock. Jesus, Jesus himself is the rock. He is the chief cornerstone. And so based on Jesus Christ himself, based on that testimony that thou art the Christ, the son of the living God, Christ, Christ said, I will build my church. And so he started his church. Now, one of the typical Protestant beliefs is that the church started at Pentecost. The church started at Pentecost, but Jesus said, I will build my church. He started his church. It didn't start at Pentecost. It was already in existence. If you look at in the book of Acts, the church was already in existence on the day of Pentecost because people were added to the church. Turn to Mark chapter 3. I'll show you Jesus calling out his assembly. And that just because Jesus started his church during his earthly ministry does not mean it was a completely organized, mature, fully functioning church as we know it today. But, that, but he, still, he still started it. Mark chapter 3 and verse 13, it says, And he goeth up into a mountain and calleth unto him whom he would, and they came unto him. A church is a called out assembly. It is a congregation. And what did Jesus do? He called, calleth unto him whom he would. They came unto him, verse 14, And he ordained twelve that they should be with him, and that he might send them forth to preach. So there were many people who followed after Christ. There were many people who, who met and assembled, but there were a certain 12 that Jesus specifically called out for the ministry. And it says he, uh, that he, might, he ordained 12, that they should be with him, that they, he might send them forth to preach. Who sends out? Who ordains people today? Who is supposed to ordain people today, I should say? doesn't mean it's always done, but it's the churches. The churches are the ones who have Christ's authority to ordain people. And Jesus himself ordained the twelve, and it was upon the foundation of Christ, the chief cornerstone, the, the apostles and the prophets, the, that the church, churches were established. The first church was established, the first New Testament church. Christ started his church. Now, some say, oh, that's, that's just ridiculous. Christ didn't start his church. But in Matthew chapter, you don't have to turn back here. But in Matthew chapter 18, Jesus is giving his disciples some instructions. If that there is, if, he says, if moreover thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, then the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. It's already Jesus is setting the foundation of how the church was supposed to operate. Even back in, in Matthew chapter 18, that was before, well before the day of Pentecost. And so Jesus already, he called out his assembly, he ordained 12 disciples, he sent them forth to preach. Uh, three weeks ago, when the message on the Lord's Supper, I already demonstrated to you how uh, Jesus did not serve the Lord's Supper to Judas, who he, he sent away from that assembly. Uh, Judas, who betrayed Jesus, was not then part of that assembly anymore. He was sent away. And Jesus served the Lord's Supper to the others. Number, so number one, Christ started his church. Number two, Christ died for his church, as you say, his churches. Turn to Acts chapter 20. These are foundational teachings on what the Bible says about the church. Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. 
Verse 28 says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. So he's talking to the elders or the pastors, the church leaders there at Ephesus. And he's saying, Take heed therefore to yourselves, to all the flock. And he's, Watch out, be careful, pay attention to what's going on. He says, To over the, all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. And it says, to feed the church of God. Now, were they supposed to feed all the believers everywhere? No, they were to feed that flock that God had set them, appointed them over as overseers to care for them, to guard them, and to feed them with spiritual food and to then to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Now, some might say, well, didn't Jesus pay for everybody with his own blood? Well, certainly he did. When Jesus died on the cross, he died for all people. He paid for everyone's sins. So there's no limit to that. But it's interesting how this is is, uh, specified here, that he hath purchased with his own blood. That there was something about his assembly, his churches, that he was... Basically, it's almost as if... Christ's whole intention, God's intention was, I'm going to pay for the sins of the world. Then there are going to be people who trust in me as their Savior. And then once they trust in me as their Savior, God's intention is then they be baptized as a believer and added to a church. It seems as if he's he's focusing here, I have purchased the church with my own blood, the church of God. With my own blood. That's God's intention for all believers to be baptized and to be added to a church. Yes. Be purchased with his own blood. So that's not minimizing Christ's atonement for all sins. It's saying he specifically had his churches in mind. All those that would be saved, baptized, and added to the church, that there's a special place in his heart for his churches. Now, the third thing here about the church is that churches of Jesus Christ are the pillar and ground of truth. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 14 says, These things write I unto thee, 1 Timothy 3 and verse 14, These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. So, the book of 1 Timothy... Uh, which is toward the back of the Bible, the books of First and Second Timothy are written. Were written by Paul to Timothy. Now Timothy was his son in the faith, as uh, Paul's son in the faith, in the sense that he had a great impact on Timothy's life, and so he was uh, giving Timothy some uh, examples or, or giving some his inst- some instruction of how he should be a pastor, of being a good pastor, and. For any pastor, the books of First and Second Timothy are, are absolutely very valuable uh, books of the Bible. So he's saying, I've written these things for a reason. I've written these things in First Timothy chapter 3 and verse 14. These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, verse 15 that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. So he's saying, here's the code of conduct uh, for how you as a pastor should be conducting yourself and how you should uh, lead others. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, notice, which is the church of the living God? The pillar of and ground of the truth. Amen. Now, I, I should have, back when we were in Matthew chapter uh, 16, and by the way, that uh, First Timothy, if, if you have a pew Bible, if you're using, it's page 297 in the New Testament. Um, why? Because my Bible has the same page numbers. Uh, <laughs> and... Um, but back in Matthew chapter 16, when it says, Jesus said, I will build my church... There are people who they will say, well, that's talking about the universal church. 
They'll say that's just talking about all the believers together. It doesn't say that. So that's an example of forcing that preconceived definition of the church upon a particular verse when Jesus says, I will build my church. There's nothing in there that gives the indication Jesus was talking about some invisible assembly, that, but he's talking about a congregation, a visible congregation. And by the way, when Jesus was on earth and when Jesus ascended, uh, and right after Jesus ascended, there was only one New Testament church of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was in, it was in Jerusalem. And so, so back in, uh, back in 1 Timothy chapter 3, are you at the, did you find it? Yes, you I'm found it. it yes. Oh, good, I'm good. Doing this he likes oh, okay, all right, got it. Got it, so. yep, no problem, no problem. Just wanted to make sure. Um, I don't usually give the page numbers, but if people need page numbers, then that's, that's fine. And by the way, the, fir the New Testament starts at number one as well. So the, the, the way it's divided, it, it starts over with the page numbers. That's why this is 297 in the New Testament. And uh, in the Old Testament, there's a 297 for this particular Bible. So, uh, But churches of Jesus Christ are the pillar and ground of the truth. The, the, what is the, what is the pillar for? You know, pillars are pretty important because they hold things up. What is the ground? The ground of the truth. That means when something is grounded, that means it's settled, it's, it's a firm foundation, it's fixed. So the church of the living God, and he would have been specifically talking about, you know, what, what's Timothy thinking of when he says church of the living God? He's thinking about the church he's pastoring. The pillar and ground of the truth. Now that changes a thought of, you know, it should change our perspective, if, if we haven't had this perspective before, of, of the importance of the church, of a local church, a, a visible assembly of believers, in that a church, if it's the pillar and ground of the truth, if a biblical church in a community is the pillar and ground of the truth, it means that place should be where people can have utmost confidence, you know what, this place holds up the truth. This place is a place to be grounded in the truth for this community. That's a great, high, and important responsibility and a privilege for a church to have that type of a viewpoint in God's eyes, that it's the pillar and ground of the truth. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 now, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Not too far uh, before that, but that would be page 247. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So we're finally making it back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And I need to see what time it is. We got time. We got a little time here. Um, each church is a body. So this is really, when we get to the, the, the message title, the body of, you are the body of Christ. Each church is a body. That, so we're finally getting to this point. But I had to lay that groundwork. That groundwork was so important for us to get to this point when you see what a church is, you see how Christ viewed the church, and you see uh, the importance of the church. And notice now each church is a body. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 1. It says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Ye know that ye were Gentiles, carried away unto these dumb idols, even as ye were led. Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. Now there are diversities of gifts, but, of the, but the same Spirit. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. And, and the message today, we're not going to delve into those, uh, the addressing of the gifts of the Spirit today uh, and, and what, uh, what the Bible says about them. But, uh, but verse 11, the whole point here in this, first, in, in this chapter but all these worketh that one and the self same spirit. 
dividing to every man severally as he will. So he's, he's, he's addressing this congregation here, and he's saying there are different gifts that people have been given. And um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to resist the temptation to delve into some of these specific gifts and explain as far as what they were and do they apply to today and that. We'll, we'll, we'll get there. We'll get there. Uh, but not today. But the whole point I want to take you, want you to get out of these first 11 verses is that any gifts in the church... Every, every Christian's been given gifts of some sort. But the gifts in the church, it's the same Spirit. It's the same Holy Spirit that gives different gifts. There may be some, there's, there's different gifts that are described in Romans, talking about teaching, talking about mercy, talking about administration, uh, and, and various things. You know, there might be some, one person who has the gift of teaching, that, that, that they just have, that's their strong point. I mean, I can teach, but I don't know that I have the gift of teaching in the same way that there are different people who have the gift of teaching in our church. Uh, I, I, so I need to teach because one of the responsibilities of a pastor is a pastor needs to be apt to teach. <laughs> if I'm not apt to teach, I shouldn't be a pastor. But that doesn't mean that's my strong point. So God has given some just a great teaching ability. Then there, then there are other people, you know what? Uh, and I'm, I'm quoting from Romans here more specifically. Um, you know, there are people that God's given the gift of mercy. In other words, those are the type of people that they just can zero in on those that are hurting and they have a special way of comforting and caring for uh, others. And, and, and they don't like to see suffering. They don't like to see people suffer. So they want to, they want to do whatever they can to, 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 to remove that suffering from that person. Now, sometimes... They go too far when, uh, and, and misuse that gift. But the whole point is the gift of mercy is good. Then there's the, uh, then there's the, the Romans talks about the gift of prophecy and, and prophesying. There were, there were times in the Bible where prophesying was foretelling. But prophesying also has to do with just the telling forth of God's word. It's a declaration, thus saith the Lord. And so there were times when the prophets, they would thus saith the Lord, here's what's going to come in the future if you do this. But many of the prophets in the Old Testament, they're just preaching the word of God to the people saying, you need to get right with God. And so there are people today, I'm not talking about forth telling in the sense of the future, telling the future, but in the sense of saying, thus saith the Lord. And they have that uh, keen sense of... Uh, be able to, being able to divide right and wrong and saying, this is right, this is wrong, according to the word of the Lord. And you know, the, the, the prophet is one who, the one who's just black and white, thus saith the Lord. They often, they and the mercy, they, they and the person with the gift of mercy often balance each other out because the mercy, it's, they're not as much in tune with right and wrong. They just, they just love people and they don't want to see people hurting. But then, you, then the the person who's just thus saith the Lord, and they're just basically, some of them, if they're not compassionate enough, they might just look over the fact that the person's hurting and just say, well, this is just what the Bible says. You need to get right with God and, and you know, basically not caring about their, what they're going through. And so there's a nice balance there. But the, that's the whole point. The whole point is there are various types of gifts Various strengths and weaknesses that each member, each part of that body has. But it's the same spirit. And so what he's trying to do is make sure they are unified as a church. And he goes on here. Um, in, in that just as we are spiritually born into God's family at the time of salvation... The Holy Spirit places members into the church no matter what their ethnic background or particular gift. So let's continue with verse 12. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that, bo of that one body, being many, are one body. So he's using this uh, picture of a, a human body. Just think of your own body. Our body has many different parts. Our bodies have... Uh, your body has many different, uh, the different parts of your body have many different functions. Your hand does something different than your foot. Your nose does something different than your ears. Your mouth does something different uh, than your eyes. But 
would you say one's more important than the other? I guess there are certain ones we could live without a little easier, but I wouldn't want to make a choice of which one I'd rather not have. I mean, would you rather not be able to smell? Would you rather not be able to see? Would you rather not be able to hear? Uh, would you rather not be able to speak? I'd rather not have to choose because they're all important. Now, if someone forced me to choose, they said, all right, what do you want to do? Well, then, okay, you could maybe make a choice, but still, you're not going to like it. You're not going to like any of it. How about, would you rather cut off a foot or cut off a hand? How about me keeping both of my feet and both of my hands? I'd prefer that. But that's the whole part, that's the whole point of, uh, here in chapter 12, of the church as a body, the comparison to a body that just because there are different roles and functions for each member of that body uh, does not mean that one is more important or less important than another. And the body is one. It's united. It's, it's together. So also is Christ, verse 13, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one body. Spirit. So just, just as in Galatians teaches that, uh, that whether Jew or Greek, there's no difference, so it's in different epistles, no difference between Jew or Gentile as far as all being in Christ together. If you're saved, you're in Christ, you're, you're part of the family of God. It's the same way when you're added to the church. It, there shouldn't be a distinction made, well, you're of this ethnicity or you're of that ethnicity or you're of this shade color of your skin or whatever it might be. You know, God's saying it's the same spirit that adds people to the church. And it doesn't matter what, uh, where you're coming from, what your gifts are. And, uh, and, and that is verse 13. Verse 14, for the body is not one member, but many. It'd be hard to have an assembly or a congregation if I was standing in here by myself this morning. I wouldn't, that wouldn't make an assembly or a congregation. The body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? Well, that sounds silly. So just because your ear is not your foot, does that mean your ear is not part of your body? No, it's still part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? It wouldn't be good if... We, if the whole body was made up of eyes, that would look kind of funny. Some of you with an imagination can maybe picture what that looks like. Just picture your whole body made of eyes. That'd be, that'd be very weird. Uh, if the whole body were, uh, the, were hearing, where were the smelling? But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it hath pleased him. So just so God put your eyes where they're supposed to be. God put your ears where they're supposed to be. Put all the parts, every part of your body's put where they're supposed to be. And just as He did that, He puts different people in the church just where He wants them. Yeah. <coughs> uh, Ephesians chapter four and verses ten through sixteen. I'm just going to read this. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we, be hence, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. So the whole point of the body is that it would grow up more into the fullness of Christ and the stature of Christ, and look like Christ in its community, in its, as it's just in its um, character and, and just growing up. There are some who preach, some who teach, 
some who clean, some who pray, some who serve in outreach. There's some cook and there's some that simply encourage. Some people have the gift of exhortation. They're just an encourager. You can do it. You can do it. You can do it. And I know some people who are exhorters. And it's been, I know one pastor is an exhorter, at least one pastor. And, you know, he's just type of person where you just want to hang on every word. And everything he says just feels like a life-giving flow. That's exhortation. Now, even if you don't have that special gift, we still should be exhorters. We still should encourage, building each other up, Ephesians 4, 29. And so after giving a generic overview of the body and its members, oh, I, I skipped a part here. Every member of the body is important. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 19. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, yet one body? And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more those members of the body, which seem to be more feeble, are necessary. So everybody's important, even if they look weak, even if they look like they can't do much, even if they can't, don't look like they're useful for a whole lot. They are necessary, the Bible says. And those members of the body, which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor, and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness, for our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to, the part, to that part which lacked. So in other words, you know, those who are maybe the strongest and the most, um, I, I don't want to use the word independent, but basically the most capable uh, of doing, fulfilling their gifts, you know, there's, there's not as much um, attention that needs to be given to that person in the sense of really helping them along. There's just some people, they just, they just go for it. They're there, they're, they're committed, and they're, able, they're very capable. But then there are others that, um, that are consi- they're called uncomely, just, just like if there was a part of your body that needed some extra attention. God has made provision in the church that even those that don't seem like the most significant parts of the church, they get that special attention. They get extra attention of helping them along to fulfill what they can do. And as I said, I I skipped ahead to this because I missed that point, but some preach, some teach, some clean, some pray, some serve in outreach, some cook, some simply encourage. And there's many other things. And so after giving a generic overview, oh, let me, let me, I'm I'm skipping ahead again. Um, But let's, let's go back uh, to verse 25. It says that there should be no schism in the body. Now, someone quoted to me, Someone used this quote here, this this verse, this phrase, schism in the body, to try to highlight that that was talking about all believers everywhere. If that's talking about all believers everywhere, you're going to end up with a lot of false doctrine somewhere because there is no humanly speaking way in this life that there is not going to be a schism somewhere among believers because of the various beliefs that there are, even among believers. Now, yes, we can have unity if everyone believes, all believers, they're truly saved, they believe the gospel. Yes, there's unity in the gospel, but there should be unity in uh, many other things as well, according to the word of God. And so this person tried to tell me that there should be no schism in the body, but there, there was a schism made in the body of Christ that hasn't been corrected to this day. And he was talking about another church he was in before and, and various things and, and, um, but I could tell in the way that was worded in the context of it that he was talking about a schism in the body as in because there was a departure from this particular church, now there's a schism in the whole big body. It didn't, didn't make sense to me. Uh, but once again, that comes with that preconceived idea of what the body is and what the church is that doesn't necessarily line up with Scripture. And so he says that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. The Bible interprets itself here. It says that the members should have the same care one for another. It's impossible for us to have the same care for all believers all around the world. You don't know what their needs are. You don't know them personally. We can certainly, uh, if we get to meet them, we can certainly love them, be thankful for them, and the unity we have in Christ but this is talking on a smaller scale than that. The members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. How is that possible 
if that body, if that body it's talking about here, the schism in the body is talking about all believers around the world, it's impossible. You can't have, you can't suffer with someone you don't know. Or I don't even know what the suffering is. But when you're in a church, in a community, or in that local assembly, then you know what the suffering is, or at least should know. You would know what the cause for rejoicing is, or at least should know. If the members have the same care one for another, we get to know each other and we can rejoice with those that rejoice, weep with those that weep. And so then we get to our text verse here. I, I say text verse, it was just the verse I read that the title of the message is based on. But all of that in this chapter builds up to this verse. He's given this overview, just a generic view of a body like the human body, and then an overview of, of the church body. But then he says in verse 27, Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. So he makes, he builds all this up. He, he lays the groundwork. He puts all these pieces together. Then he points it right at them and says, Ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. He says, That's you I'm talking about. So those things I just described, that should be the way you function. That should be the way you operate. In verse 28, God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, gifts of healing, helps, governments, diversities of tongues, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, have all the gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret, but covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. And I'm not going to deal with those verses today. Once again, the point, though, is God has set different ones in the church, they don't all have the same gifts. They don't all have the same responsibility and function. But it's the same Spirit. It's the same God who sets the people in the church, sets the members in the church, gives the specific gifts. And it says, He divided to every man severally as He will. In other words, it just means it's up to God. The gifts that you have, the gifts that I have, they're just simply up to God what gifts that we were going to have. Some people are very gifted with music. Some people aren't. You know what? It was just up to God. who He decided who was going to have these certain gifts. Some people are gifted in teaching, as I mentioned before. Some people aren't. That's up to God. Some people are gifted in, uh, as I mentioned, just some of the examples, mercy and, and, and various things. We should all, now as far as those spiritual characteristics of mercy and compassion, those should be something that is, are evident in all believers' lives. But there's something in some people, they just have a little extra dose. They have that perception of, and, and that emphasis on helping the hurting, caring for the hurting. So very, various different, uh, different types of gifts. And so that, that is the uh, overview, which then leads to that specific statement, now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. And I'm going to finish up with just a couple of things. Number one, then, how does one become a member of Greenfield Baptist Church? Well, first of all, there are three different ways. Uh, there's technically four, but three main ways. Uh, the fourth one, you would hope, doesn't happen uh, because that has to do with if someone's been put out of the church, they can be restored if they're repentant. So we'll not, that's, that's the fourth way, technically. But the three main ways. Number one is a credible profession of faith, and believer's baptism. So if one, someone says, I, I know I'm saved, I know I've trusted Christ as my Savior, and they give that credible profession of faith, and, and they haven't been scripturally baptized, then they can be received as a member of church upon their baptism. If someone who's already been saved and baptized, they can transfer from another Baptist church of like faith. Uh, if, if they're already a member of some other Baptist church of like faith, then they can just they can transfer. Or if they've not been a member of a church for a while or just have been out of church or whatever the case might be, uh, they can give a statement, a testimony of their faith and that they've already been baptized, scripturally baptized, and they can be received. Now, I didn't bring a copy of it with me, but we have, uh, I think we have one back in the filing cabinet, but... There we have a copy of the statement of faith. And so and one of the things that is emphasized in 1 Corinthians is the unity of the brethren. That for someone to become a member, they also need to be in agreement with our church's doctrine as outlined in that constitution in the statement of faith. 
And that doesn't mean that you have to know all of it. It just means you can't be bringing in, willfully bringing in false doctrine as a member of the church. Uh, such as, let's, let's say, um, if someone says, well, you know what? I'm saved, uh, I'm baptized, I want to become a member of the church, but, but you know what? I don't believe in a literal six-day creation. I don't believe God, I, I believe that the earth is millions of years old and that it evolved and it was a big bang and all those things. Someone like that can't become a member of our church. Okay, that would, that is, that'd be disunity among the body. A, a, it'd be a great doctrinal error based, it'd be a great departure from scripture. Uh, if someone says, well, you know, I, I believe that, um, yeah, I believe in salvation by grace through faith, but I also think you need to, to do good works. And, um, and, and first of all, I'd question, are you even saved? <laughs> uh, number two, if someone's bringing in some false teach, some teaching contrary to Scripture, then that person can't become a member of the church. Now, let me make it clear. Everybody is welcome to attend. If, if a person desires to be here for the preaching of the word and for fellowship with other believers, uh, everybody's welcome to attend. So you don't have to be a member to attend, but there are certain things that need to be in place in order to become a member. And it needs to be that unit. It needs to be, first of all, be truly saved, be scripturally baptized, and also be in agreement with our church's doctrinal statement. Now, maybe at some point in time, I'll just preach right through our church's statement of faith. Um, but uh, we'll, see, we'll see how that goes. It's, uh, there's just so many things in my mind I want to preach on and different things, so I don't know when we'll, when we'll do that. But um, that's why we have so many services, because, I mean, you can't cover it all in one service a week. You know, you've got to have Sunday school. You've got to have morning <laughs> service. You've got to have evening service or preach something else, evening service. Then, you gotta, then Wednesday, I mean, you've got to have different times. It's a whole package. So that is how one becomes a member. Now, let me just mention, let me just say this. There are people who would even disagree with the, even the whole idea of church membership. Well, first of all, because, number one, the word members, the word membership is not used in the Bible. The word members is, and it's here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. The word members is used all over the place in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It's talking about different parts of the body. So the word members there is parts of the body. You have then a body of believers with its members. Members. Number two, we see the uh, very much church membership in the book of Acts. Uh, turn, turn there. This will be our final uh, few verses here. I want you to see this. Uh, Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 and verse 37. Now this was on the day of Pentecost. Acts chapter 2 and verse 37, uh, it says, now if you have a pew Bible, it's page 170 in the New Testament. Acts chapter 2 and verse 37 says, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. This was after Peter preached. And said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, I'm not going to get into this, but that verse does not teach, the Bible does not teach for us that we need to be baptized to be saved. Baptism is not a part of salvation. There are people who misuse that verse to try to prove that. That's not the point of the message today, but I just want to say, it's not, um, you, get, you get saved and then you get baptized. Because you have been saved, then you get baptized. Uh, For the promises unto you and to your children, to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Now notice verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls added unto them. Added to who? The, the assembly that was already there. And they continued, notice, this is what it means to be added to a church, added to a congregation, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. So in other words, there needs to be a a, 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 a I don't know if you'll use the word submission, at least a reception of the doctrine of the church and fellowship. So it means they were there. They had fellowship one with another. 
and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And then uh, verse 47 says, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. So what's God's order? A person gets saved. They get baptized. They then are added to the church. They then continue in doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and prayers. That's God's order. And that's God's intention for all believers. That if a person is not following that order, they're missing out on some things. And so this, I, there's, there are a lot packed in there as far as how much I covered today and two weeks ago. But it's, it's such a, an involved subject to, from start to finish. It, there, there are a lot, it's a very basic really in, in the, at the end of the day, but because of the various ideas and mindsets and perspectives on the church and on membership and on those things, it, it, it needs that thorough going through, the thorough presentation to set those things down and in order. Ye are the body of Christ. Is there someone here who needs to be baptized? Is there someone here who needs to join the church? Is there someone here who just, maybe just need to recognize your place in the body? You know what? I have a place. I have a purpose here. And I want to serve the Lord. And I recognize my gifts might not be the same as other gifts, but, but I just, I want God to have His way in my life. I want God to have His way in this church. And that's what's going to make the difference here in Greenfield, is for there to be a body of believers that the church that is the pillar and ground of the truth in Greenfield. So that when people see Greenfield Baptist Church, they know that church cares about the Bible. That church cares about the truth. They might not always agree, but they know this church is holding up the truth of God's Word. And they know that church also cares about people. Wants to see people from deliver, delivered from sin. Wants to pe see people saved. It wants to see lives changed. Yes, it's a journey, just as Christ called his 12. You know, our church, we celebrated our fourth anniversary last week. And that's not a long time for a church. In church time, that's not a long time. So yes, just as Christ called his 12 and there was development and maturing of the church and the settling of that first church, same thing still happens today in new church plants. Yeah, you, know, you can feel like, oh, it's 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 small, it's not doesn't come, you know, you know, it doesn't have as mature of a feel in the sense of it's got all the programs, all the different things, as many things. It's a process. It's a process. It's a step by step, just following the leadership of the Lord, trusting God to work, and being faithful as to what God has called us to do as the body of Christ.